Okay, so today we're looking at John 20, and this is a story we all know. And the trouble with the stories we all know is they get familiar and then they don't come near us. Yeah, fair enough? So what I'm trying to do today is to take this, the sort of underlying principle that exists within this story, take it out, unwrap it a bit, have a look at it, play with it, and then we'll go back to the scriptures and see that what I'm saying is about right. Hopefully it's better than a bad light. Um, but modestly forbids. Right, so okay, I want to engage then with this problem that arises when we try to persuade people of spiritual truth using the thinking games of contemporary secular science. And don't tell me it doesn't happen because it's attempted all the time. And Christians spend a lot of time putting energy into trying to play the science game or some other modern intellectual game with the things of God. With, for better, one of a better word, theology. Do you see what I mean? <coughs> and uh, you may, from time to time, think we're in the school of noddy and big years do philosophy, right? Well, maybe we are, but I'm going to do a lot of philosophy because that's a headache. But just, just give me five minutes and see if what I'm saying makes any sense and then test it with John 20, 24 to 9, to see whether what I'm saying is actually at the heart of that passage. Okay? Here's a photo of a man taken in Swansea about 1937. This guy here. Anybody? Oh, I'll put his name on the boards and that's blown it, isn't it? Um, yeah, Wittgenstein. Now, Wittgenstein was one of these really, really brainy guys. Three of his brothers committed suicide. They're from a high powered family. Yeah? Um, and uh, he's a guy who wrote a lot about the relationship between truth as it exists and language, the way we express it, because we've only got language to express truth in. If you look at a lot of his books, the language he uses is kind of maths. And people like Bertrand Russell say, well, I think he's a genius, but I'm not quite sure I understand what he's saying. So brainy people found him very, very brainy. He taught in Cambridge for a while as part of his career, and uh, he has been foundational in writing stuff about the, the way we arrive at truth and how we understand truth. He wrote a lot about, and he's, he's so misquoted, he's so misunderstood, and he knew he would be because he's clever and abstruse and away from the rest of us. But um, <clears throat> he does a lot to do with what he calls language games. What it boils down to is this, any sort of discipline like uh, food science, or um, building, or uh, teaching and pedagogy, or uh, dance, has got its own language. And it's got words in that language that mean certain specific things. And if you use those words in other places, you sort of cross the rules of the game. Practice. If we're playing football, heaven forbid, but if you're playing the round ball game, right, you've got to run with the offside rule from football, not the offside rule in ice hockey. Fair enough? And if you're playing ice hockey, you don't run with the rugby, football, the, Welsh, the World Rugby Union you know, rules for offside. Right? Is that fair? You stick with the rules of the game you're in. Just because what's offside in ice hockey isn't the same as what's offside in football, that means it's not offside. It's offside in ice hockey. Making sense? I can see you're all thrilled with my sports illusions. I have much more on that, but you're not interested. So, so, so you know, don't try and play the offside rule from football in rugby union. It's not going to work. And imagine, imagine what happens if you're sitting down to play, play tiddly rings and you start trying to play an offside rule at all. Because the offside rule says you can't play it forward. You know? And tiddly rings is all about playing forward, isn't it? It doesn't mean the offside rule in football isn't legitimate just because it won't work in tiddly rings. And it doesn't mean that what you play in tiddly rings is illegitimate because that's offside in football. Everybody happy? I wasn't going to hurt you. I know I use the P word, philosophy, but I wasn't going to hurt you, okay? This is where we are, and this is what we have to deal with because it's to do with knowledge and how we arrive at it. And Christianity is about deriving knowledge from God and passing it on. We have to deal with this. Why are we discussing this? We're establishing that different sporting traditions have different definitions of what's right. Different criteria for deciding what's right and true and fair and all the rest of it. So if you're in soccer, right and true is determined within the discipline of that game according to its rules. Same in rugby union, same in soccer, same in ice hockey, same in any other sort of discipline you care to mention. Chemistry, biology, physics, history, English, literature, art, even dance. Right? They all have their own criteria for what's right and what's true and the way things work. 
So, by way of illustration, no, there are plenty of illustrations of offside in different games. Stay with that. Let's talk about offside in chemistry. Because in chemistry, what's offside is stuff you can't do repeatedly, for example. Here's what you do in chemistry to arrive at truth. You ask a question. What happens when you mix this with that? Right? I'm not very good in chemistry. And then you do a bit of background research to see if anybody's written about this already. Yeah, fair enough. You work out if anybody's given you any help with it. And then you construct an hypothesis. Well, I mix that with that, it makes a nasty smell and goes bang. That's the popular chemistry, isn't it? Okay? Not okay. That's my hypothesis. Right then, let's test my hypothesis. Great. Fume covered. Poof! Big cloud of smoke, yellow or green or something horrible stinks the place out and everybody leaves the room. Fantastic success. You've tested your hypothesis by doing an experiment. That's not good enough. You've got to then go along and do that again. See if you can repeat it. Does this always happen? And somebody in another part of the world now is going to test that hypothesis. They do the same experiment and poof! They've got big clouds of acrid smoke and nasty smell and a fume covered in Puerto Rico. Okay? We've tested our hypothesis by doing an experiment. We're going to analyze our data. It went bang there and stank. It went bang here and stank. Here's the conclusion. Here's my report. Was my hypothesis correct? Yes. It went bang, made a smoke and stank. That's your criterion for proof in chemistry. Do you want to try using it in history? Because by definition, we're his Caleb. It would be fun to use it in history. Yeah, but that's only because you think you're going to make a bang and a smell in history, isn't it? Yeah, but it doesn't prove anything in history except that you just got a detention. Okay? <laughs> that's all it does. And of course, the thing with history is that it's, it's about what happened once. Once upon a time. It's not about repeatability. Things happen in history, and you know, there's a saying, history repeats itself, but believe me, it doesn't. Because that's happened. So you can't use this criteria to prove that relies on things always happening the same way if you do X, then Y happens. Where history is concerned. Or literature, or art, for example. Because somebody walks into an art gallery, there's a painting, it has its effect, but they walk the next day. By definition, things that happen in history, well, it's dealing with once only non-repeatable events. And my friend I'm talking to about Jesus, he wants proof about Jesus, but he won't accept the system of proving things that applies to past events. He's only prepared to analyze, for example, the reliability of the accounts for the resurrection using the rules of natural sciences. Which say there's no way to repeatedly demonstrate the resurrection of Jesus, so it didn't happen. See the problem? And this is the naturalistic fallacy that we're buying into all the time in our apologetics, in our trying to persuade people that Christianity is credible. <clears throat> of course, if you look at what Jesus says about what makes Christianity, current Christianity credible, he says, they'll know we're Christians by our love for one another. Paul says, they'll know the genuineness of our apostleship and our Christian faith by precisely what we're prepared to put up with in his name. There's a biblical apology. I would be prepared to give an answer for the hope that's within you, yet, yeah, but it's got nothing in there about philosophical apologetics. Adopting tools that don't actually fit that discipline to support the reliability and the credibility of what you're saying about Jesus' his death and his resurrection. Demanding scientific proof for the historic events that lie at the heart of the Christian gospel is always going to be a bit like insisting on playing tiddlywinks using the ice hockey offside rule. It's not going to work. You've gone outside of what the discipline is and does. And that, here we go, back to the Bible, that is precisely, well, pretty much what Thomas is trying to do in this passage that we're looking at in John chapter 20. See, Thomas is demanding scientific proof of the historic events that lie at the heart of the Christian gospel. And Jesus is calling for faith and repentance on the basis of credible eyewitness testimony. And meeting with him in the spirit, but not in the lab.
Thomas is looking for material evidence. And that negates the whole big faith issue at the core of what Christ is about. What he says to us. Okay. <clears throat> the first disciples needed to meet the risen Jesus. They needed to see him. To be able to be the eyewitnesses of his resurrection glory. But things are changing. The whole game, if you like, is that Jesus is going back to glory. And whilst meeting him is the big life-changing event for those first disciples, and for us, of course, the completion of his mission requires he rise from the dead and go back to his Father in glory, and you won't see him anymore. Now we trust that he's that we meet him, but we meet him as we encounter him as the Spirit comes and deals with us from the Word of God in our own lives, day by day by day. It's a different game. Those rules don't play in this game. It's a different game. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Now Thomas is saying, I want to play by the old rules. I want to play by the material proof. I want to play by the evidence of my eyes, the feel of my hands, the touch. And Jesus is saying, <clears throat> because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me. And yet have believed. Why? Because they belong to the future. Because they belong to where we're going here. This is the future of the new covenant, the people of God. Meeting Jesus but not by sight and touch, by faith, in the Spirit, on the basis of a different sort of evidence, which applies to what's happened here. The point Jesus makes in verse 29 is precisely that. Now that's not to say what he's saying there, because you've seen me, you believe, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have not believed. That's not to say there's not evidence, but there's evidence out of a different game. And it's not less legitimate because it's out of a different way of looking at things, a different criterion for truth.